Hello, it's Scott Manley here. And first up, I want to apologize because I've really been kind of MIA sort of in the last few weeks because had a lot of work going on, had a lot of day job stuff going on. So I haven't really been keeping up with the science, but the science, of course, keeps going. And uh, I'm just going to kind of talk at the camera about the things that I'm, I'm interested in. Well, actually, there's really two things that I'm interested in. First of all, the Gaia Data Release 2. So Gaia is this European mission which has been doing high precision astrometry. That is trying to figure out the exact locations of stars uh, on the sky. And they can do this to something like seven micro arc seconds. And the way it works is a spacecraft that rotates, scans the sky and has two telescopes at about 160, degree, 106 degrees apart. And they, by measuring the stars relative to each other and then scanning the whole sky, they can apparently figure out where everything is to, yeah, you know, seven micro arc seconds, which is just staggeringly small. Of, and then if you do this over time, of course, you then get parallax data, you get proper motion data. They're doing very limited amount of uh, spectroscopy so they can measure radial velocities. This mission, they've released something like 1.3 billion, I was going to say million, 1.3 billion stars with, uh, you know, high quality, relatively high quality data. So this is reshaping our understanding of distances in the galaxy. They have some amazing tools and you can play around with it. You can get the data. I'm going to admit every time I've gone there, the site has been overloaded because of course there's actually real scientists collecting the data and doing useful stuff with it. But the other thing that I really, really got my attention the last week was accounting. And that may sound a little out of sorts, but it is basically doing the numbers on the finances of spacecraft, specifically NASA's commercial orbital transportation uh, program and their commercial resupply and the commercial crew program. Between these, they've spent something like $18 billion, or that will be their ultimate expenditure till like 2024 or something like that. So NASA's Office of the Inspector General, they published a report looking at all these programs and it sheds light on all sorts of interesting things. Now, whenever SpaceX comes up on one of my videos, whenever I cover it, you know, you're going to get the Elon fanboys that come in that say SpaceX is the cheapest, Elon is amazing, he's going to take us all to Mars. And, you know, I love you, the fact that you guys like him. But, you know, realism has its place and there is such a thing as Elon time. He does frequently overpromise and underdeliver. But I like the guy and I'm going to give him a lot of your credit for it. But on the other hand, you have the Elon haters. And many of these people come in and they claim that Elon is a con artist, that SpaceX are just taking huge amounts of NASA money and not getting giving anything in return. They're burning taxpayers' money to make the company look good. And a lot of that narrative actually is driven by, sometimes it's driven by articles that are being promoted by more traditional space services that perhaps don't like competition in the market. And, you know, this is, uh, I'm perhaps exaggerating a little here, but this report, the, o the OIG report, actually just shows you how much money is being spent here. It's something like $60,000 per kilogram to put uh, cargo to the space station. What's missing is how much it used to cost sending stuff on a, a Progress spacecraft to uh, the space station. I think a seat on a Soyuz for an astronaut is something like $80 million. So this is clearly a lot cheaper than that, but an astronaut isn't just a piece of meat uh, floating in a you know, can of spam or whatever. Europe used to have their automated transfer vehicle. It's no longer flying. Uh, Japan, they uh, had a transfer vehicle for a while, but it's not doing anything either. So yeah, uh, commercial resupply is uh, where a lot of this stuff is coming from. And there's two parts to commercial. There's two uh, participants in commercial resupply. There's SpaceX that used the Dragon spacecraft and there is Orbital ATK with their Cygnus spacecraft. Both have had their uh, teething problems. Both have had launch failures. Uh, in particular, the ATK one was one of the more spectacular ones. Uh, they, of course, have then since gone on to rebuild their Antares rocket. Uh, the Antares rocket, actually, it's, it's worth noting that Orbital ATK, this is a real international vehicle, 
I hadn't been aware of the, the first stage booster, the tanks and uh, the structure are from the Ukraine. The engines are from Russia. The second stage solid rocket booster is from, you know, Orbital ATK. And of course, the spacecraft, the Cygnus spacecraft is their own. Um, now, they charged a whole lot more per launch than SpaceX for the first phase of commercial resupply. And, you know, that made SpaceX look very, very cheap in comparison. The Cygnus actually could carry a little more cargo by mass to orbit, and so that made it look better in some ways. But it actually got even better performance than the Dragon because the Dragon had space issues. It turns out that while the Dragon could carry something like three and a half tons of cargo, they never filled it up that much because they couldn't fit that much cargo into the spacecraft. So uh, I think it never hit more than like 60% of its payload capacity and isn't going to be expected to exceed that over the whole of the commercial resupply phase one. Now commercial resupply two has been bid on and they're you know working through their final issues but you know that's going to be between uh, SpaceX, it's going to be Orbital ATK and it's going to have Sierra Nevada with their Dream Chaser. And I hadn't realized this, but until I looked at the report, uh, it showed it shows the spacecraft and how they compare. And the Dream Chaser is currently only slated to fly once, but it actually has a higher cargo capacity than either SpaceX or Orbital ATK. And it also has the ability to return the stuff to a runway. That's probably the most exciting thing about CRS2, but... The other thing that's come out of this is the prices have just gone up in general. Actually, Orbital ATK have reduced their prices, so by about 14%. SpaceX, per flight, they're going to be charging 50% more. Now, that 50% more is offset a little because they are now able to fit 30% more cargo inside their spacecraft. They are going to recover and, you know, recover the spacecraft faster and therefore get the cargo back in the hands of the people that care about it faster. And since it's going to be a Dragon 2 capsule, it's actually going to be able to dock autonomously with the space station, which in theory means the ast astronauts can kind of do their own thing without having to go through the whole grabbing the spacecraft with the robot arm and berthing it. So there's four programs that are actually covered by this. One is the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, which is kind of the umbrella program that basically gives grant money to various uh, companies to try and explore the possibility of resupplying the space station. And in the early days of COTS, a whole bunch of different companies were involved. And, you know, Boeing was involved in the, was trying to pitch for cargo delivery. I think they wanted to put the European transfer vehicle on top of a Delta, for example. And Lockheed Martin had a similar idea, but they were going to use a, an Atlas V, um, there was obvi obviously rocket plane Kistler, which failed to go anywhere and their money ended up going, you know, getting shared around. But out of those programs came, you know, SpaceX and Orbital ATK, which actually got contracts. So CRS-1, Commercial Resupply 1, that was actually a series of contracts where if they failed them, there would be penalties. Similarly, Commercial Crew, which hopefully will have the first test flights this year, that Originally, the research was, you know, funded by COTS, but now it's funded by a commercial crew. And here's where, you know, you've got a great data point for all those people that are, you know, are persuaded by the myth that uh, Elon is some kind of huckster, right? Because they always ignore the fact that Boeing and SpaceX are the two companies involved in commercial crew. And Boeing are charging something like 40% more than SpaceX for the same services. Um, yeah, this is it's a really interesting report. It covers a, a lot of interesting details that I hadn't actually, wasn't totally aware of at the time. Um, they, they talk about the aftermath of the two failed launches, the, you know, the, the Antares failure and the, um, the SpaceX CRS-7 failure. They also, you know, cover that prices rose in general 
because the same money for the second phase of resupply is now being split between three companies instead of two. And while that in theory is supposed to add diversity and uh, ensure against you know failures by providing multiple partners, it does mean that the average cost of everything has gone up because now the integration costs have had, you, know, you need more money for integrating the new designs, for te testing and uh, fewer flights overall. So yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, it's really kind of fascinating to look at this and realize that, yeah, we're spending like $70,000 per kilogram. That's, that's what the plan is. And realize even at that price, that's still way cheaper than it was to send stuff up to the space station on the space shuttle. That didn't happen very often. They did take cargo up, but yeah, most of the cargo ended up coming up on Progress and other spacecraft. I also looked, and, and apparently there's been something like a hundred, over 100 flights to the space, over 100 unmanned, uncrewed flights to the space station. Some have been failures, but I think we're at like 99 successful automated spacecraft sent to the space station. So soon we will pass that magic 100. Other, uh, another interesting thing that I, I see is they commented very specifically on the Dream Chaser using the Atlas V and how that makes it way more expensive than it should be. They have the option to explore alternate launchers in the future, but they didn't go into any details. All I can think of is there's not very many alternate launchers out there, but it would be really interesting to see if a Dream Chaser would fit on top of a Falcon rocket. Another bit that caught my eye was the observation that while this report was just looking at the commercial services that NASA was contracting for directly, it did point out that by funding SpaceX and giving SpaceX the ability to, you know, demonstrate the ability to launch these payloads, it means now that they can actually offer these services to other payloads that NASA needs. And this has then had the effect of driving prices down in general. So money spent here has actually saved NASA money elsewhere. Another thing I noticed was that um, Sierra Nevada are not going to really do a test flight of their Dream Chaser because it's not required. They're going to fly to the space station on their first launch, which is you know impressive if they can pull it off. They're, they're going to have kind of a shorter window to scale up their stuff, but obviously I'm excited to see this happen. And the whole report really is kind of more like a high-level management thing, but there's so much, so many interesting pieces of information that are coming out of this. Not technical information, but more the kind of decisions that managers need to take when they're trying to keep the International Space Station supplied and running. And this is the most expensive object ever built by people. Uh, and uh, yeah, interesting times. So yeah, I'm just going to you know sign off and I'm going to try and get back to doing some science. I've got like three or four scripts written now that I need to actually record. Still have going nuclear, uh, yeah, you know, episode six with this uranium enrichment is there, but I keep finding new and interesting stuff that I need to shuff, shuffle stuff around to fit in. But yeah, uh, I will be around and I will see you guys. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.